Today, today, I'd like you to say the word with me, today. Can you say it? Today. 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 You know, you've just quoted one of the most famous words in the New Testament. The word today was the first word of the first sermon that Jesus ever preached. He'd read a scripture, put it to one side, and then said, Today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. And I'm sure that congregation suddenly stopped planning their lunch, what they were going to do during the day, what they were going to do during the week, and had an, an awakened sense of expectation that something was going to happen that was going to impact them. That it could be revelation. It could be some impartation. It might be some transformation. It could be inspiration. It could be liberation. It could be edification. And if they had not yet received Christ, it could be their salvation. So I'm praying that even as we share the, the spirit of expectation will rise in your own heart. That the setting is much the same. Christ is here. The Word of God is here. The Holy Spirit is here. We are here. And He wants to speak. And He has something each for us. Amen? Amen. And I believe it's around the subject of holiness. Holiness is a word that is kind of out of date. In fact, during the week, I asked some people in, um, uh, in cafes and um, even at the lab test uh, the other day, giving some blood, what do you understand by the word holy? And their answers were like, oh, elevated, very high, um, saintly, like, like a saint. Some said like inner peace. And so they all went around kind of the understanding that we have of holiness. Walking in holiness is one of the great themes of the Bible. So how does the, <clears throat> how does the Bible define holiness? Well, would you believe there's 1,189 chapters in the Bible, there's not one definition of the word holy. It's surprising. But there are many references on being holy, seeking holiness, pursuing holiness, pressing into holiness. And I think one of the most important verses on holiness, out of all the, the references in the Bible, is this one here. That says, without holiness, no one can see God. You might want to read it with me. Without holiness, no one can see God. Now, it's not talking about kind of the visual holiness with our, with our eyes, like I'm seeing you, or you're, and you're seeing me. It's not that kind of seeing. Rather, the meaning is how we would use it in terms of, like I might say, I'm seeing Stephen on Thursday. It means we're going to meet, we're going to have coffee, we're going to have fellowship, we're going to have interaction. We're going to share our concerns. We're going to support each other. We're going to have some intimate uh, conversation. That is seeing God. That is holiness. And without holiness, we cannot enter into that relationship with God that is intimate, that has engagement. Now, it's interesting that the subject of holiness is absent in many churches. I was thinking back, it was probably in the mid-70s that I heard the last sermon on holiness for someone who was given over to actually seeking holiness, living holiness, rather than just reading out of a textbook on holiness. His name is Barry Reed. He was a, an evangelist here in, in Auckland. And I think the churches uh, avoid this for, for two reasons. One is that there's this understanding that when we become Christians, we already have holiness because we have Christ in us. Christ brings holiness, and that is true. There are many scriptures 
that say things like this. We are sanctified by Jesus Christ. We're made holy because he comes and he lives in us. But the verse goes on to say, we are called to become his holy people. Become is a continuous tense. We keep on being holy, becoming holy. And so there's a misunderstanding that holiness is just not like a one-off. Today I become a Christian, I'm holy, that's it. I'll always be holy. The second reason is that the church has obviously entered the spirit of this age. And, and Western education has, has evolved so that the system now trains us to, to be content with like our best shot. There's no standard that we have to reach in order to achieve a goal. Just, just like give it a go, NCEA, resubmit, can't fail, be happy with what you are. And that influences the church, and so when it comes to holiness, like just do your best. You're okay. Do your best, and you'll be fine. And the churches downplay the possibility that people are actually failing to live up to God's measurement. God does have a standard. He has a person in Jesus Christ who was the standard to which we ought to attain. And I think that the mantra in many churches, excluding this one, of course, is to uh, keep pretending, uh, keep serving, uh, keep giving, and you'll be fine. God will be satisfied with where you are. What is holiness? And when we look at the general themes of the scripture, we see holiness is actually a form of separation. Not like separating children fighting or separating pieces of paper. It's a separation from something to something. And it's a separation from the world. It's a separation to God. And we see this illustrated in many parts where God called Abraham to separate himself from the Ur of the Chaldees and separate himself to Canaan, which he was going to make to be a holy land. God called Moses, separate my people from the morals and the ethics in these pagan nations and separate them to me through these commandments, through the book of Leviticus, with all the commands that God gave them in terms of how they should live, how they should run their uh, families, how they should run the nation. And so we are called to separate ourselves. And Israel's failure, as we know that in the end, by the end of the Old Testament, God had withdrawn himself from, from Israel. He had uh, disowned them. He had cut them off. He had abandoned the temple. He had given up on the priesthood. He said he hated, hated the sacrifices that they were making. They had totally failed to live as a separated nation unto God. Having a form of godliness, says Paul, but denying its power, this was Israel's situation. Can you read it with me? Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. The word form here means to be uh, an image, not, not the real thing, a, a resemblance to something. And I could illustrate it in this way. By showing you this picture, the little girls here, you might have recognized her already. Who's the woman in the picture? This is a non-family question. Who's the woman in the picture? Who is it? No, it's not, it's not her. Claire's here. That's a, a form of Claire. That's a resemblance, you see? That's an image of Claire. But how can I have a relationship with this? You see, I can't. But that's what Paul is saying that, that Israel had fallen into, that they just had a form of holiness, but there was no reality. And it could be the same for us. You know that we can go through a form of 
holiness. We can attend church. We can be involved in, in serving the church. We can sing the songs. We can contribute to the offerings. We can do everything that is, is offered to us to fill a role in the church, but we po only possess a form of holiness. It's possible. It's a challenge. One writer put it this way. One is the name, the other is the thing. One is the appearance, the other is the reality. One is the body, the other the spirit that penetrates every part of our frame. One requires little effort, it cruises from Sunday to Sunday. One requires complacency, the other demands sacrifice, wrestling with principalities and powers, running the race, fighting the good fight. Holiness is, is pushing in. Each of us probably possess a high degree of having a form of godliness. And I don't exempt myself. Having a form of godliness but not being able to see God as he would reveal himself to us. We're seeing darkly. We're seeing him through a veil. We see and, and relate to someone who is God-like. But we haven't connected with the true living God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of heaven and earth. We're not connecting with him the way that he intends us to because we're so satisfied to live at a low level of holiness. One of the things that has really affected me and changed my life is this dynamic here that I just want to explain to you, that there were two reasons for the cross. Now, the first one is obvious, and it's explained in the Gospels. The four Gospels tell the story. They explain exactly what happened. Jesus came, died on the cross, in order to cover our past. The cross is all about the past. It covers our sin. It covers the judgment that we stood under. And Jesus died for us. He took our place. And so we have forgiveness. And so in the Gospels, we know the joy of being uh, in relationship with Jesus Christ. He's our Savior. But there's also the other side of the, of the cross. And that's described in the book of Acts. That in the book of Acts, we find that the followers of Jesus were able then to draw on the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome the sin that held them back from really following Christ. Paul said the kingdom of God is not word, it's not, it's not a form, it's power. It's not just discussion, it's not just sermon, it's not just singing, it is a power that comes from God that actually enables us to push the devil back and to break his hold over us, and all those things that keep us unholy. It's only the power of God that can cut those off. Now you see in the, in the Gospels, the disciples were Christians, they followed Jesus, but before Pentecost, they were always on the run from the devil. They were meeting behind closed doors, they had no power over the devil, they hid from the devil. But in the book of Acts, the, the Holy Spirit came, and then they were empowered to actually take it to the devil. And they were able to uh, free people, deliver people from, from demonic influence. They were able to heal, they were even able to raise people from the dead, all because of the power that they could draw from through the cross of Jesus Christ. And it's tragic, and looking back at my own life, it was tragic for me to live so many years as a Christian only seeing the one side of the cross. And it was only through the charismatic renewal that I discovered the other side of the cross where the power lay. You with me? And so when I was baptized in the Spirit and be able to understand some of these things, to see the, the, the truth that was there, I then had the power to be able to deal 
with a lot of things in my life. I'm now able to push the devil back and push the devil out and get rid of those things that undermine my holiness. I can uh, recall some of them. That I, I, I had the power then to cut off bitterness and unforgiveness towards people who wronged me and who continued maybe to wrong me. To overcome dependence on people's approval. I was always dependent. To break my ability or my, my um, contentment to just live like at half of my capacity to be holy. I just went for an NCA pass mark. Achieved. I oh, achieved what? And to be able to rebuke my fear of failure as a Christian. And you'll have your own list. You'll have your own list of things that the devil will bring to influence you to demise, thank you sister, to demise your level of holiness. The devil will do his best to pull down your holiness, because if he succeeds with that, he depowers your whole Christian life. And you can work, as I say, until the cows come home. But you'll never know that intimacy that God holds out to you. Holiness. The main theme of the Bible, I believe, and it's progressive it's a progressive experience that continues throughout life. Our aim is to be more free from sin and more like Christ. And as I've just said, many of us are longing to be more like Christ, but we haven't got the power to do it. You follow me? We've got to be free in order to know the intimacy that he wants to give us. There's only one person in the Bible that didn't need to progress in holiness. Who was that? Jesus Christ. He was the only person in history that didn't have to progress in his holiness. The rest of us are faced with the challenge of becoming more holy, more like him. Because then we see him working out his purposes through our lives. I find this an easy way to explain the dynamics of progress. That at one point in our lives, we were unholy. We were without Jesus Christ. And then we became saved. Jesus came into our lives. The Holy Spirit came into our lives. We were now sons of God. And so we set off on this Christian life of, of development, of becoming more holy. It says, when we become Christians, we're born of the Spirit. So now we're in the realm of the Spirit. And so now we're progressing. We do make mistakes. We do fall back. Perhaps in my case here, it would be more some of the dips might have been down here off the chart. But it illustrates the fact that it is up and down. We are learning as we're walking in holiness. We're learning the value of holiness. We're experiencing the power of holiness. We're overcoming sinful habits. We're enjoying the benefits of holiness. We're learning how to defeat Satan. We're recovering from mistakes, failures, and we're becoming more Christ-like until that day when the Lord calls us home, whether that's sooner or later. At some point, he does call us home, and then we're in his presence. And we hear him saying, well done, good and faithful servant, right? Now, many of us think that's applying to our, the, the things we've done. We've been very faithful servants. We've always done this. We've always done that in church for him. But I believe it's more in terms of how far we have developed our holiness to become more like him. It's becoming like him that he wants us to be committed to. How much have we conformed to his likeness is what he will comment on when we meet him face to face. It wasn't the work we did. It's how much like him we became. And if we're, where, if, we, if we're where he wants us to be, he'll tell us, well done. Well done. And we'll go into that timeless 
dimension of being like him in all his holiness and glory and power, majesty, there in the presence of God. Finally, four non-negotiables. Each of these words I've highlighted from James are verbs. My old school teacher, Mrs. Broderick. I thought like there was God and there was Mrs. Broderick. And then there were my parents. So if Mrs. Broderick said it, that overrode what mum and dad said. Mrs. Broderick. And she taught me a, a verb is a, an action word. It's a doing. So when Paul wrote here, submit, it's not just um, a suggestion. We submit, and we submit to the Word and the Spirit. You know, submit is probably one of the most unpopular words in the world. You look everywhere, from, from, from school children to people... Um, uh, in society, to people in politics, nobody wants to submit. Submission is bad. So it's the most unpopular word out there, but it's the most beneficial word in the Bible. You see, as we submit to God, submit to his word, as we understand it, we try to implement it, as we do that, we bring ourselves into alignment with God's blessing. Many want the blessing without the submission. Just name it and claim it. That's rubbish. It's, it's through submission that we have the increased blessing of God, the deeper relationship with God. In fact, I'd go so far as to say this. My degree of submission determines my degree of holiness. I'll say that again. My degree of submission to God and His Word determines my degree of holiness. That's why Paul puts that at the very start. S uh, James, submit. Submit. It's not a negative thing. It's the most positive thing we can ever do. And then the reverse of that, instead of submission, we resist. We submit to God. We resist the devil. You know, it's inevitable that the devil will try to bring down your level of, of holiness, will, will cause you to compromise the devil is a master of influencing us to compromise. Do you know, God never tells us to do something that we're incapable of doing. He tells us to resist the devil because he's empowering us. He's giving us his name. So we call on the name of Jesus. We apply the blood of Jesus. We can actually take it to the devil. Because of who Christ is, not because of what we are. And what I love in this, this uh, statement and, and the rest of the, the context of that verse is that the devil just doesn't back off a little, just like, okay, I'll back off for 10 minutes. The word fugo means the devil actually escapes from danger. Fugo is escape. The devil flees. He has to get out of the way, out of your life, out of your sphere of influence, because of the power that you can draw on to apply to him. Amen? It's not us. He can flick us off easily. It's the power of God working through us that enables us to speak either orally or, or in our hearts and our spirit, and we can resist him and put him to flight, as it says. He has to flee. Get out of it. And then we find this incredible invitation to come. To come near to God. Now back in the Old Testament, when Moses was at the burning bush, he was drawn to it. But what did God say to him? Don't come. Don't come any closer. This is holy ground. You cannot come. But now... Because we have Jesus, the invitation is come. Don't stay there. Come. Come and have intimacy with me. The, the writer of the Hebrews says we come with boldness. 
So it's not just even a tentative coming, like dare I come? Should I come? When I think of what, what happened last week, should I come? It says come with boldness because you're coming in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? And then finally, purify. Purify your hearts. And it goes on and says, don't be double-minded. And so purification always means or always refers to double-mindedness, how easy it is that we fluctuate. We can be holy here, the Jesus talk here, go out there, talk to someone about our business, what's happening during the week, and immediately we revert back to where we were. We fluctuate so easy. And God knows it. Paul knew it from experience. Don't fluctuate. Draw on the power of God to stay consistent and focused and determined to do all within yourself to walk in holiness. I think I told you last time I, I preached many years ago I had gone to the, to the region of Irian Jaya which is now Irian, the second half of, of Papua New Guinea into the Baliem Valley with the Christian and Missionary Alliance, who were the biggest um, missionary organization in the world at the time. And they were working with the, um, the Danis, the most primitive uh, tribe uh, on the earth, many of them still using um, stone axes and, and so forth. Um, if they felt they had um, upset a demon, they'd cut a finger off, throw the finger in the fire. Um, so the devil wouldn't come and kill them. Uh, so many people just with thumbs, no fingers at all, particularly the women. Um, terrible. And so the missionaries were working with them, and the, the regional supervisor was telling me uh, what had happened out of one of the uh, remote areas where the missionaries got in there, and one of the local customs was that they would um, ha have a ceremony where they would dance and shout, and they'd be screaming out and leaping around, and the missionaries eventually found out, once they got some language, what it was all about. And they were actually calling on the gods to kill the people they hated. So they'd name the people and call on the gods to kill them. Now, years later, the supervisor who was talking to me said he went back to this area, and to his surprise, to his shock, disappointment, he found the um, Christians you know, still getting into these ceremonies, leaping around, shouting, calling, and so forth. And he said to the, uh, the local missionaries of the, the language, now, what, what's happening? Like, this is terrible. They're still doing what they did. And the missionary, no, 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 they're not. What they're doing excuse me, What they're doing is shouting to God, Father of, of Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior, God. They're calling on God to kill the sins in them that they hate. To kill the sins in them that they hate. Even though they were new Christians, they were rising in their understanding and their hunger for holiness. Can you imagine it? Do we pray that God would deal, kill, remove, exercise the sins in us that we hate, but we continue to tolerate, to live with, to put up with, and to give a pass mark to? That's the challenge of holiness. The scripture says, without holiness, we're never going to see God. What a simple statement. Without holiness, no one, it includes you, includes me, no one will see God. No one will enter into that level of intimacy that he invites us into, he empowers us to, to embrace. Because within that lies our destiny and the meaning for life the center of God's very purpose for our hearts. A 
if you feel God has spoken to you this morning about this area of holiness, I'd like you to stand with me, because I'm already standing, to say, yes, Lord, message understood. I saw a movie uh, from World War II, and it was the Battle of Britain, and the pilots were in their planes, and they were just waiting for the order to take off and engage the Germans, probably never to come back again. And the voice, the message crackles on their phone. Take off, Norris, whatever the, 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 the second was, engage the enemy. And their reply was, message understood. And then they take off. If you feel that you're able to say to God this morning, message understood, I'd like you to stand as I close in prayer. Lord Jesus, here we are. Here we are, Lord, the ones you died for. The ones you gave your life for, Lord. The ones you left uh, a, a, an example of exemplary holiness to which we cannot achieve. But you've given us your spirit that enables us to be the people that you've called us to be. And I pray for us, Lord, that you continue to speak even as we fellowship, as we leave this place, Lord. And show us what we should and could do to become more conformed to your image, Lord. Not having a form of godliness, but having the power of holiness in our lives through Jesus Christ. Lord, we take hold of that this morning. We say, Amen. Amen. We say, Praise the Lord. Amen. We say, I receive it, Lord. Help me, Lord. Yes, Lord. We submit. We resist. We come and we purify in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior and our coming King, to whom we will stand before one day and receive his commendation. Well done. Well done. Good, good servant. Faithful servant. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you.